For as much hype as the WWE loves to give its monthly pay-per-view events, in recent years there's been less of a farrar of excitement once they've come and gone, and more a sense of, what the hell did I just watch? From future stars being extinguished before their time, screwy finishes that leave you scratching your head, and a depressing lack of Killian Dane matches, the WWE has suffered in many, many ways from having too few brilliant payoffs to its angles. And it must be frustrating for the company, as if you look back at some of the pay-per-views that Vince's baby oil bash bonanza has been putting on, it seems as if they were so close to being great, a fair few times bar one stupid or glaring mistake. So what we're going to do is carry on a similar idea I did with Michael Hamflit on wrestling gimmicks that just fell short of greatness and apply it to events themselves. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 bad WWE pay-per-views one tweak away from excellence. Number 10. SummerSlam 2010 SummerSlam 2010's main event was set up to be the talking point of the age, and with all the hype surrounding this moment, you could be forgiven for being a little bit more lenient with the title matches that also appeared on the card that were pretty lackluster. However, the choice here to save the entire pay-per-view is shockingly obvious. Put the bloody nexus over. The WWE failed to recognize that just because these NXT rookies were new didn't mean that they had to be booked as inferior to the older stars. That's how you make people care about the future, Vince, you leather-faced strangler, by giving them a chance. With a few wins under their belts, this would have meant that the group as a whole looked strong and, when they split up, would be in a much better position than they were eventually left in. There's a reason that people only really fondly remember the night that Wade Barrett and company debuted, because this was the only real time that the company made them look like any form of credible threat. Number 9. Royal Rumble 1995 Unfortunately, the talent pool was pretty shallow in 1995, with the company's annual battle royale highlighting the worst of the financial peril the WWE found itself in during those lean years, and what we got was a fast-paced Royal Rumble, in fact, the fastest in the entire WWE history. And the fix here is very simple. Let the match go a full hour in spite of its limitations. After all, if anyone from the field had it in them to go 60 minutes or thereabouts, it was the eventual winner, Shawn Michaels. And the story with Davey Boy Smith and HBK going end to end, it was tremendous. But there are several stars in that match that could have split the task to allow for a similar story told twice over with its biggest rivals. A card featuring high quality matches for all three titles wouldn't have been so forgettable had the Rumble delivered. In the modern era of shows going on far too long, this tighter turnaround actually harmed the end result, making the event feel piecemeal and highlighted the absence of stars. This might have exposed a few workers for what they really were, but it would have added even more credibility to those that could go the distance. Number 8. WrestleMania 4 WrestleMania 4 birthed the start of one of the biggest and most commercially and creatively successful angles in company history by crowning Macho Man Randy Savage as the brand new WWE. WWE Champion. However, in order to get to this outstanding moment, fans had to sit through an absolute slogfest in the prior matches. It was so, so long, and it wasn't helped by the fact that it was a funeral-like atmosphere in the Trump Plaza. However, there was one thing that could have been done to make this a whole lot more manageable. Stop having so many screwy finishes. Of the 16 matches on the card, yes, you heard me, 16, six of these matches didn't even have clean endings, and three of those had interference. It's a dirty, dirty card that was leaned on heavily to protect egos or muddying the waters, and all they really needed to do was just have some clean wins. It might not have affected some of the match quality, but in terms of making the run-up to the oh yeah moment of macho madness, it would have made things feel so much more refined. Number 7. December to Dismember You just knew we'd be talking about this pay-per-view, and with good reason, as it is the lowest ranking WWE event in memory, made even worse by having only two decent matches on the card in the form of the opener and a somewhat reasonable main event. And yet, this could have been made all the better with one tweak that seems so obvious that it's actually startling put the championship on CM Punk. By doing this, the straight-edge superstar would have retained his undefeated streak at the expense of the Big Show, Hardcore Holly, and Test. Test. This is indeed a test, and would have been a huge statement
commitment to the rest of the company to wake up and take notice. December to Dismember wasn't a disaster just because it's a two-match television taping presented as a pay-per-view, but it was also booked into oblivion without any soul of ECW. This was just a nameplate over the face of Vince's homogenous look and was as much a different product to the other two brands as I am a f***ing hair model. Punk could have been the compromise, but Lashley was chosen because, well, I mean, just look at that beef. Lashley's got beef. Number six, WrestleMania 27. When it comes to WrestleMania events, pacing does become a huge issue, as the extended length means that there's even more chance of the audience burning out early. While Mania 27 promised the world, it didn't deliver much to raise it above sea level, but the worst piece by far was the match between Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler. Here, you had two commentators. Well, one commentator and one wrestler well past his prime, engaging in a match on the grandest stage of them all. Now, commentary feuds are trash. I'm sorry, they just are. And this one was dragged out so much that it was excruciating. However, I'm not saying that they should cut this match and put on someone from the undercard more deserving of a space to prove themselves, although they totally should have done that. I'm saying that as soon as Cole was in the ring, Lawler should have absolutely destroyed him. By doing this, the 70,000 people in attendance would have been given a high moment, an energy burst to keep them locked in for the rest of the card. But instead, they were deflated and unenthusiastic when it came time to carry on. And also, side note, the mysterious GM here overturning the decision was utter bollocks. Number 5. King of the Ring 1995 Long considered the all-time worst WWE show, the fundamental problem of the King of the Ring 1995 remains the tournament itself. Mabel winning was part of this master plan to propel him to the top of the card, but the massive problem was that he simply was the wrong person to head the company as it was going through its thinnest ever audiences. So how do we fix this? Well, we booked Shawn Michaels to win the tournament instead. I mean, look at what we got. We got Savio Vega wrestling four times in one night. That is ludicrous. But apparently, thinking of Shawn as the top man in this situation, apparently that is the step too far for Vince. Vince clearly had fallen in love with his concept of pushing Mabel, but he had precisely two stars in the bracket, Michaels and The Undertaker, and he blew it with the pair of them. An irrepressible HBK even appeared to chastise him on air following the conclusion of a 15 minute draw, managing to get a whopper on camera as he yelled bullsh** after the bell. Number 4. Survivor Series 1993 This time period was peak cartoon era for the WWE. It was all comedy and clowns, and this had bloody four of them. Four doinks! Come on! Jesus. Gimmick after Saturday morning TV gimmick was stepping up to their plate and being met with boredom and booze, and I know earlier that I said that removing a match would be sacrilege, but here it is the only way to save this pay-per-view. The match I'm referring to is the absolute abomination that was Men on a Mission and the Bushwhackers and Bam Bam Bigelow going up against the Head Shrinkers and Bastion Booger, which is basically a list of things that Vince finds funny that no one else ever did ever. By removing this match, we would have had the seeds of the Bret and Owen feud, the build of Yoko Zuna and The Undertaker and Lex Luger just being the greatest thing in wrestling ever, able to stand proud. Oh, Lex, you can take me on that express ride any day. Number 3. WrestleMania 9 Though being fondly remembered because of the aesthetic carried by casual fans old enough to live through it, it's actually loathed by loads of other people for very specific standout moments that came to define it. Objectively speaking, the card fails to deliver a single genuinely great match, and whilst the booking is questionable on the undercard, it is downright reprehensible in the main event. So how would you fix this? But why not start with Brett losing cheaply at the beginning of the night. And we have to face facts that Vince McMahon was never going to let the Hitman leave Las Vegas with the championship as he was still so heavily swayed by Hogan. But if you began the night with Yokozuna destroying Hart and then cheating to win, and then having Hulk challenge for the match later on in the night, you could have avoided the utterly cheap feeling of the ending of the event as it stands in reality. A victory here would have sent everyone home happy without emasculating the man that would actually still be there when the Hulkster took his bull home shortly shortly after. Number 2. WrestleMania 25 How WWE conspired to make their 25th edition of the Show of Shows one of the most boring in history remains a testament to confusion. Almost every major name from the time was available, several of the programs going in had extreme heat, and most of the booking was in relatively good faith. However, what it showed was that while there was plenty of stars, none of them ever felt anywhere near enough ready to take over and get out from underneath the champ, John Cena. However, 
In The Undertaker vs. HBK, we got a match that was so undeniable and so atmospheric that it lifted the crowd up to unprecedented heights. Something that crashed and burned with Triple H vs. Randy Orton, who insisted they went on last. The tweak here, though, is to put the dead man and Sean on last to give them the due that they deserved. Trips and Orton just didn't have nearly the same chemistry as the veterans, and it left the crowd lamenting the length of the event rather than going home with a happy ending. And number one, the greatest Royal Rumble. Money speaks louder than morals, seem to be the thinking behind the WWE's 10-year deal with Saudi Arabia, and by signing the deal, Vince proved once and for all that he will sell the very soul of his company to make a quick buck. Now, the greatest Royal Rumble was a hell of a show, ridiculous and absurdly fun with so much to re-watch and laugh with and at. Plus, it had a massive Royal Rumble, which is easily the best gimmick match type ever, and gave us 50 men in it duking it out in April. And so, when it comes to what we'd actually change, it's really simple. We'd change nothing about the matches. We'd just change where the event took place to remove the horrible stigma that surrounds the pay-per-view. And considering what happened with the recent Crown Jewel and with the wrestlers being detained, maybe that would be for their best interests as well. And there we go, my friends, those were 10 terrible WWE pay-per-views that just could have been saved with one simple tweak. I hope that you enjoyed that, my friends. And I bet you think to yourself, oh, where's the mum joke? Where's the mum joke, Jules? Oh, come on, mate, I know that we hate them. You know what? That's my tweak, to fix a bad list into a great one by taking it out. Look at that. Clever, self-referential. I'm a legend. But you know who else is a legend? You are my friend. You deserve love, happiness, and success. We all do. And I hope that you are well and treating yourself fairly, both physically and mentally. Because remember, if you are struggling with problems in your life, you can share and express yourself freely. There is no shame in that, and no one should have the right to judge you for it. If you need help, then please remember to speak to friends, family, and support professionals in the industry, because people care way much more than you might realize. Trust me on that one. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me at RetroJ with a zero over on Twitter. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.